Coming up on Theater Talk, what made you trust Lisa to have no trepidation <laughs> about let, trusting your masterpiece? With well, her? I knew Lisa's work. I mean, we both come from the from the street, from the lesbian street. <laughs> <laughs> You're on a picture of the lesbian street. The, the lesbian hard street. <laughs> street. I don't know why I keep going. Have you, I just it, like, must all, it must be all new to you, Janine, the lesbian street. <laughs> well, I have an announcement. <laughs> <laughs> Anything for a Tony no. Award. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Exactly alike. I see everything. Caption. My dad and I were nothing alike. Ring of Keys <laughs> from Fun Home. The powerful and really gut-wrenching, in a good way, new musical <laughs> now at the Circle Square. It's got a lot of laughs, too. Don't forget yeah, that. That's right. Right. We're so pleased to be joined by Janine Tesori, who wrote the music for Fun Home, Lisa Crone, who wrote the book and lyrics, and Alison Bechdel, whose novel, Fun Home, based on her childhood and life and her relationship with her family, is the basis for this amazingly wonderful musical. And for those of you who aren't in New York, I can tell you that Fun Home is generating tremendous excitement here on Broadway as an original uh, uh, musical, American musical, by the way. It had great reviews at the Public Theater, and it is about to open its circle in the square. So welcome to you all. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm Susan Haskins. All right, so what... Um, was the attraction for you guys to Allison's novel uh, to turn it into a musical? Was it your idea, Lisa? Uh, yes, I uh, worked on it first um, uh, for a little while before uh, Janine came into it. Trying to write the music yourself back then? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Interestingly, that didn't go very well. <laughs> Knowledge of uh, music Everything would have helped. Everything sounded like this. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> I didn't see what was wrong with it, but then... Then I was just abused of, of my fondness for it. So yeah. um, I, once I took the accordion out of your hands, we were we were. Oh, that's right. I thought, I thought about that. Like, I knew there accordion. was an Oompa Loompa song missing <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> but, but I want to go back. I want to go back before you got to it, and I want to ask Allison to give us, a, you know, a thumbnail description of what this this story is about your life. It's a memoir about my childhood with my father. It's about actually just a few period, a few months of my life when I was in college, when I came out as a lesbian, told my parents this great news, and found out that my father had been having secret affairs with men for a long time, uh, which really blew me away. You had no inkling at all. No, no up. idea. Although looking back, I started putting it all together. His, you know, Big obsession with Ger antiques and <laughs> Jerry Herman soundtrack <laughs> collection. <laughs> <laughs> I say, let's, let's rethink. We've got two days before we open. We do. Let's put it Get back that in. number in there. Get Sorry. that back in there. Sorry, Allison, before you so rudely interrupted <laughs> by your composer. Uh, that's okay, because this is part of the craziness of the whole thing, because then the book, the story it takes this terribly tragic turn. My father, shortly after this, all these mutual revelations, killed himself. Mm. Uh, and so it was this terribly confusing time of my life, these few months when I was 19. And even then, or shortly after that, I could see that there, this was kind of an amazing story that, you know, my father and I were both gay growing up in this little town. Our lives took very, very, <clears throat> very different courses. And I felt like I wanted to write about that, but I, I couldn't. Nobody knew my dad was gay. No one even knew he killed himself. He was hit by a truck. So these were big family secrets that I couldn't, I didn't think I could reveal. But 20 years later, when I was almost 40, I felt like, ah, oh, I think I can do this. I think it's not going to be so terrible for everyone. And also in the 20 intervening years, you had become a very important cartoonist. Well, I had, had become a cartoonist. I, did, I drew a comic strip for many years called Dykes to Watch Out Dykes For. Dykes to Watch Out For. Yeah. And so you were developing this skill and, and artistry as a, as a graphic novelist and cartoonist. Yes. More importantly, though, I think there had been so much 
cultural change in those 20 years that it, it was possible to, to write this book. Um, what about the issues of other family members um, when you're reviewing the family secrets or if there are family members who you waited to, for them to die before you really came out and told things? Or how no. did they react to what you uh, decided to talk well, about the family in the book? my mother was not too keen on it, but she, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was very straightforward with her. I told her I was going to do it. I showed her and my brothers the drafts of the book and they thought I was a little nuts. They didn't quite know why I would want to tell this story. You dedicate the book in part to your mother. She's played by Judy Kuhn, yeah. a very I, important character important. in the musical because you wonder how your mother endured what she, her part of the secret. This is something that these guys did amazingly was they fleshed out the character of my mother in a way that I didn't in the book. I, f I was, I knew my mother would read the book so I, I tried to keep her character as minimal as anyway. possible. What is the mother's song that gives such a, such a tone to her character? Um, one of the things that we, we did with um, Helen is that Helen was a pianist. It's, it always feels so strange talking about your mother. You know, we, we do it. She's so. still alive, your mother? No, she, no. she died like two years ago. I mean, that's the thing about this piece is we are, we, it wasn't just writing a story. It was writing Allison's story and her family's story. And so there was always that, that kind of, um, you're on the third rail of their, their, your family is coming, you're coming to see it. And so we really wanted to get it right. And I remember that one time where we had start to, you know, there's certain things you have to make up and fictionalize. And I remember you said, that didn't happen, but it could have happened. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, now we, are, we understand right. this world. And so Helen's song um, has this sound. And she sings, days and days and days, that's how it happens. Days and days and days. So it, she lists all the ways that a lot of, a lot of women in that time, uh, it's made up of these bite-sized chunks where your, your days are filled with tasks and things that you do and suddenly you look backwards and you think, where did it all go? Mm -hmm. When you look at it a page or a frame at a time, you can see, but not while you're in it. Perhaps uh, tasks filling up your days because you're looking away from something you don't want to know about? You fill your days up sort of in, in a, with illusions in some way because you, it prevents you from confronting what's really going on in the family? Maybe, yeah, my mother certainly kept herself very busy. I mean, both my parents were maniacally busy with their various creative pursuits. And I, I love how the play captures that too. My father restoring our house, my mother playing the piano, acting in summer stock. It was a very uh, lively, creative household. You have a, a wonderful image in the book that you say, our house was like an artist colony and we were all in our different pursuits, isolated from each other, but completely creatively involved. Lisa, how long did it take? Were you working by yourself or with Allison to, to, to boil down this amazing book, which is nonlinear as your musical, it jumps around in time, to how long is, is the musical? But two hours? Oh, uh, no, it's about an hour and 40 minutes. And I have to say, to, to compliment you, I was so mesmerized by it that I, wasn't, I never looked at my watch, I never looked at my program, I never asked myself, when is it going to be over? And that's very high recommendation. Go on. <laughs> she didn't rush to get to the ladies' room at the very end. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I worked, uh, sort of thought about it and wor uh, you know, worked on it for about a year. Yeah. Uh, I think I started in like 2009, and then Janine uh, and I started working together in 2010. Allison gave us this tremendous gift, you know, she really turned it over to us and she was very available when we had questions um, about things. The, the book feels, it's, it's, I mean, I have to say it's a masterpiece. It's like we've been able to refer to it like, a, like the Bible. You know, every single time we've done a rewrite. We by, you know, sometimes we were at that point where we're like, you know, on page 61 right. on that cell over there. <laughs> and, it, and it's a very interesting relationship between that book and what we've made because we've had to... There are no, in theatrical terms, there are no scenes. There are no characters. Mm. In the sense there are theatrical characters. There is no, and, but when you read it, you feel like that's happening. Wait, what do you mean there's no characters on the wall? I mean, you see, uh, you see Bruce in this moment. You see him as a child. Yes. You see um, her imagining of him, um, maybe walking down a street in New York. But in terms of a theatrical character that has an arc, right. a forward-moving arc, that does not exist in the book. So when it came to having to figure out what was going to happen in this play, it, it took, uh, I would say, a good three years before we, and 
uh, before we could figure out what the mechanisms were going to be, what would, what would entail a scene? Because nothing happens in her childhood in dramatic terms. No, nothing changes. You can't, so there's a feeling like you could just, and I think there were people who felt that we should make our lives easier and just have this be a forward moving narrative. But there, there is no, the things that so happen they in go the childhood the, don't add up to his suicide. What made you trust Lisa to have no trepidation <laughs> about let, trusting your masterpiece? Well, her? I knew Lisa's work. I mean, we both come from the, from the street, from the lesbian street. <laughs> the les <laughs> we're going to picture the lesbian street. The, the hard street. street. <laughs> lesbian street. I don't know why I keep going. Have you, I just, it, must I, all, it must be all new to you, Janine, the lesbian street. <laughs> well, I have an announcement. <laughs> <laughs> anything for a Tony no, Award. <laughs> I'm engaged. Right, anything, right. Um, so anyway, you were saying that you knew uh, Lisa. Well, yeah, Tony. I knew her work with the five lesbian brothers. I didn't. Oh, I love I, that. I, I love that because I used to live in New York and I, I was around them, but I didn't know her autobiographical stuff that she went on to do well in 2.5 Minute Ride until we started working together. And then I read that and saw her work and lo loved her stuff even more. But because we came from the same place, I knew I could trust her with this lesbian material and to get it right. Is this the first lesbian musical on Broadway? I would. Can you think I of would, another one? Mame. I mean, Vera and uh, Mame are pretty close Mame. there. But well, I think so. I'm sure I mean, there's could, others. Yeah. No, I don't think it's sure. openly lesbian, or even a, in the closet lesbian music. Well, I, I think don't. it's you know, Lisa has this great quote that people say, "Oh, it's a story that's bigger than a lesbian," <laughs> because it's actually the the same size. As, <laughs> this is a, a, a story about a father and a daughter. Yeah. And um, well, but that's interesting too because we don't see a lot of musicals about fathers and. And daughters. That's exactly, yeah. I mean, what you just said is so much of the core. In the dramatic literature, in plays or musicals, fathers and daughters are not examined. We thought of King Lear, mm -hmm. uh, there was one other that someone had, had, had said, and it's fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, mm -hmm. but not fathers and daughters. And it's a very complicated, often complicated relationship that that is. Mine was, yours was, you have this amazing relationship with your father, but you examined it in 2.5 minute ride to such a, a degree that I find that, well, that's, that's the one other piece that I would say is a father-daughter. Violet. Violet, right. I was thinking that there's, a, about the question of um, its attraction to a wider audience, and I thought, you know, that's, a, uh, I think what I have noticed is that people ask that question to say, well, I love the piece. Will other people be nervous about it? Right. And there's and there's that kind of an assumption. But I thought for for us, there are probably more people who have personal relationships with lesbians than people who know the King of Denmark or the Prince of Denmark. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like we, all the time. Well known lesbians. Or the King of Siam. Right. When we go to yeah. theater, we identify with people. You know, I'm not a I'm not a salesman. But I can go <laughs> see that play right. and identify with that person. That's what we do in the theater. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I got, you know, several um, t texts and emails this week, you know, from women who were like, I had no idea that I had never seen myself in a musical and how much that means to me. Yeah. But that doesn't mean but that those people weren't mother, going to the theater right. all the time right. and identifying with other people, as we all do. I mean, every woman has that experience because there have been so few uh, female protagonists in general, but we know because we I, because we love the theater that you can identify with people who aren't like you. Right. We know that your father is the main character, a, a magnificent performance by Michael Cerveris. And it's harder when you're older to begin. But the thing I, I find myself wondering is, in this time where we all are aware of more of equality, would this man have suffered so and lived so if he'd, he had been living at a different time. That's the whole story. Yeah, it's the whole story. What a painful existence he had. But then you wouldn't have been born if he... I know. <laughs> he wouldn't have written the book if he'd I been know. liberated well, and comfortable with himself. See. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird, conflicted feeling I have. I mean, I'm, I love the play. I, I love celebrating it. But it's also... There would be no play if my father hadn't killed himself, you know? So there's this... And there'd be no you if your father hadn't been felt he had to get married right. and have a family even though that wasn't what he wanted. Right. In his heart, yeah. Well, that's where the drama exists. Yeah, that's where the, the drama gap. exists. When this came to you, were you thinking, ooh, like Annie, cash cow? Huh. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you know me. <laughs> I know. You're always go, oh, going, first. For, going for those crass commercial um, shows all the time. I would say this is the most important musical that I've ever written, right. ever. Um, it brings everything that I feel like I've ever wanted to do in a piece. <laughs> and um, uh, Now, I, can you be more specific? Yeah, I think, for, you know, it's a, it's a woman close to my age on stage. Mm -hmm. And that idea of that you're looking backward as much as you're looking forward and trying to understand and grapple with what your parents gifted you with and what they burden you with. Mm -hmm. And that's universal. I mean, Mark Harris, the brilliant writer, had said, it will only affect people who are parents or children. And, <laughs> and you know, that really says it to me. You're always, until the day that you die, grappling with that relationship. And then there you get to the part, sometimes if you're lucky, where you grapple with your relationship with your own kids and your parents and you're sandwiched in between. Um, and, you know, and you, and you separate those, those gifts from the things that you, you know, from the boulders, I would say. So I, I knew that it would be a musical as soon as I read the book because you could feel... You could feel what, there's a great heart and a great soul and a great intellect behind the book. The musicality and the abstraction is the only thing I think that, you know, when we discussed it, I thought I knew that it could sing because of the things that were, remained unexpressed. And between the incredible conflict, how it would do that was really a, a hard, you know, it's just like any, all musicals are hard. This one was particularly hard because it doesn't fall into a formula. You know, there's no, I want, I don't like formulas anyway, but right. a lot of characters sing because they want something so badly. But how do you do that if you don't know what, know what you, you want? want. But so you, you have your family. Song. This is from The Who. And they, they, he, they sing. He wants the real feather duster used on the bookcase. Find all the books we read and carefully restore. He wants the Heppel White sweet chair back in the parlor. You know, he wants, he wants, he wants. And they're like, what does he want? Yeah. We can feel it even though we're seven, we're nine, we're ten. We know that there's something, but you can tell at that age, I, I knew in my other father, what he wants is not what he has. Mm -hmm. And that incredible fear of a kid that you're not enough. When, Allison, did you realize in the writing of the book, oh my God, this is the thing I've almost been born to write? When did you realize the, the, the magnitude of what you, what you had done? Well, I... I don't know. I was just very devoted to that project for a long time. I worked on it a, a long time just alone in my basement without showing it to anyone, without selling it. It was a very personal, intimate project. Um, I guess when I finally did sell it, it was ex an exciting moment to think that it, it was something that was going to be publishable. You know? wow. Can live outside the basement. Wow. <laughs> yeah. and then, and then we'll I'm curious, Janine. Um, and Lisa, when you guys are sitting down to write the show, is there a moment when you find the, the, the musical voice of the show? I mean, can you give me an example, maybe the first song you wrote where you said, that's the, 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 the tone I want to set? You know, really early on, because Lisa's done a lot of uh, lyric work but hadn't written a musical, so the very first thing that we did is we sort of set up our own musical boot camp and wanted to locate that, that part of, you know, in that time, the singer-songwriter, quality of it. You know, the Ring of Keys has a singer-songwriter mm -hmm. feel to it. The opening, which Lisa identified, you know, I just came up with it and we figured it out after the fact why it was important. And the very first thing we wrote, which was based on your script, was that, can you sing it? Because I can't. <coughs> <laughs> this is your big break, Lisa. <laughs> Finally. It's all paying off. Your right support. Here, ready, people. Daddy, hey, Daddy, come here. Okay, I need you. What are you doing? I said, come here. You need to do what I tell you to do. Listen to me, Daddy. Hey, right here, right now, you're making me mad. Something like that. Right. I want to play airplane. I want to play airplane. I want to play airplane. I want to put my arms out and fly. Yeah, so I thought, OK, that's the heart. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the heart of this piece with the desire, and then we, that's where we start. I think we knew, I mean, Allison's book begins and ends yeah. with that image of her yeah. flying, and um, I think we knew, I mean, a, a musical has to have one primal need, a mm -hmm. primal drive that's straightforward and that pulls it from beginning to end. And of all the things that were complicated about this, I think we knew from the beginning that that desire of that child to make that, to get her father's attention, not just his 
mental attention, but to make physical contact with him, that she wants him to pick her up. She wants to be picked up by her father. That desire is the desire that the adult Allison doesn't know is her desire, mm -hmm. but it is what pulls this from the beginning to end. And so we don't have an I want song, but in fact, the first line of the play is, Daddy, come here, I need you. Right. And she demands that he That's the locomotive. Pick her up. And, and she had given you that in the book. It's in, I yeah. mean, you know, really, even though we made up so many things, you know, there are things, there are scenes and lines and all kinds of things that are not in the book. But that being said, everything comes from the book. I want to interject, you have this astonishing and wonderful cast. And you had the great, great and very audacious idea to have Allison played by three women, one of them being a now 11-year-old child. She is, she just, in, in, in that, as Marlon Rose would say, you either got it or you don't. Yes. Right, she yeah. got it. You know, Sydney. She really has it. Lucas. Sydney, Lucas. Sydney Lucas. But they all, the thing that this, um, you know, this show is a family of actors. And I know that sounds so cornball, we're a family, but they have been all doing it for a really long time. Long no, everyone has practically has traveled with us if they've been a able, you know, to fit it in their schedules. And we have really stood for each other. And the, the final rehearsal the other day, we looked at each other and thought, is this it? Mm -hmm. I guess this is it. You know, now you go fly away. But that, that kid has something happening here that is so unbelievable. I heard you call her a savant recently. I yeah. love that. Yeah, she That's really accurate. is. Allison, is there a particular song in uh, Janine's score that is your favorite or touches you the most? Janine and Lisa's score. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Janine and Lisa's score. <laughs> they're, they're all amazing. You're getting the lyricist. Janine's a giver. <laughs> they're you know, all Lisa. incredible songs, and I sing them to myself constantly. I won't sing now, don't worry. <laughs> Go but ahead. I, I guess I would say Ring of Keys. Ring of Keys, the amazing butch anthem. <laughs> Yes, how you, how you discover your, you see your first butch lesbian as a child. And I... Yes, and that you have a child singing this in the play, which feels very brave. How does that go? You played the intro, but... Uh, yeah, can you give us a fuller version of Ring of Keys? Hmm. Feel free to join in that. Someone just came in the door. It's going to be a little higher. No one I ever saw. Before we go, I want to say we've neglected, I think, to mention that one of your father's jobs was he was the director of a funeral home, hence the name Fun Home. Fun home. That was what we called it. And one of the great, great <laughs> numbers is when you kids are playing in the Fun Home. You made up the conceit of the television commercial, though, for Fun yes. Home. Yes. I was looking through the book to see if I'd missed that. It took us a long time to figure that out, but it was, but we, you know, obsessively did commercials. I mean, kids of that generation did, did. commercials. You but this is a huge metaphor. Yeah through your book of the funeral home. Can we get a little bit of the fun home commercial song? You could even join in on that one, Alice. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, come on, Alice. You can do it. <laughs> your uncle died. You're feeling low. You got to bury your mama, but you don't know where to go. Your papa needs. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> You got, you got to give them the best. Come to the fun home. Sing with me, Janine. That's the Bechtel Funeral Home, baby. The Bechtel Fun Home. Next to the Baker's Department Store in Beach Creek. Oh, it's high. <laughs> wow. No, I know. I got to have little, you got to have little. Uh, we, we have got this child who has crazy <laughs> gifts. Yeah, now, now, now you're 
you're never going to get her away from the piano. So, oh, I, don't I never had another one, Janine. Oh, I got another one. We're here all night. <laughs> <here all night. laughs> She's got a million of them. All right, the show, like the show is uh, Fun Home based on the uh, uh, excellent graphic novel by yeah. Alison Bechtel, written Bechtel. by um, uh, composer Janine Tesori, and uh, Lisa Crohn's also the director. And now I know oh, there, I know <laughs> the director, Sam Gold. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, thought, I always assume that you direct your. No, work. Sam Gold is oh, the director. No, wonderful. No director, wonderful. never. Okay. Know how. Uh, and I know these two are, I know they're uh, confirmed theater geeks. Has this made you into a theater geek? I'm becoming after? a theater geek, yes. Oh, because, but there's still resistance, I detect. Well, and it's just, there's a lot to catch up with. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell from this show. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for being our guest on it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bravo. Who roll the credits? Thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.